as for January 2020. You can apply by tonight. Um, yeah, no. no yeah, no pressure at all. But um, we do have July once in 2020 as well, which you can apply anytime after tonight. Um, so you have the opportunity, opportunity to earn credit towards your Australian degree, and you can also get $6,700 um, of government funding to help fund for your trip. Um, to be honest, it's not enough. <laughs> um, but um, there's positive psychology, which is what I'm doing in the Netherlands. You've got um, a case study, a migration case study in Mexico, which I know someone has done. He's doing honours now, but he's done that before, and so that's amazing. Um, forensic psychology in Canada. If any of you have thought about being a profiler once in your life, that'll be a great opportunity. <laughs> Um, and then there's legal psychology in today's USA, and we've also got personal branding, impact, influence, and effectiveness in workplace, and that's in Italy. Um, if you're interested, you can email me, and I'll send you the links to all of this, um, or you can scan it with your phone if you've got one of those. But yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs> It definitely sounds like a nice idea, particularly if you get a little bit of government funding for it. Um, I don't know about you, I've always fancied myself a forensic profiler and I love sort of, uh, you know, uh, the FBI type sort of profiler shows. I know forensic psychology is very popular uh, as a career direction for psychologists, but also that people like to do uh, a Masters of Criminology sometimes after their... Uh, uh, complete their psych degree. So I know there's a lot of interest in those areas. Okay, so we'll get on to today's lecture, which will be personality assessment methods. Oh, I haven't turned my mic on. My apologies. That might be better. Can you hear me now at the back? Yep. Okay. So uh, today we're going to go through personality assessment methods. You know by now roughly what personality is, uh, why we need to understand it. Now we'll go through methods of actually assessing it. Okay. So it's reading, it's chapter 12 this week and chapter 11 last week. I would strongly advise you to read the entire chapter. Uh, the green boxes section are important. Read the green call outs um, to extend your understanding. Okay, so we're going to go through objective measures of personality, which is what you're doing in your assignment. It's an actual objective measure. Then we're going to cover uh, projective measures. So things like the Rorschach ink block test. And there's actually quite a wide range of tests you can use. Um, the psychometric properties perhaps of the Rorschach are a little bit dubious, but others say that it's quite uh, reliable and valid. But there's some really good uh, other tests there that have some actual theoretical grounding. They have really good scoring systems and they're still widely used today. We'll also be covering the assumptions and criticisms of projective measures. I don't want, just want to present what my opinion is. I want you to be able to form your own opinion. So if you can have a look at both sides of the argument, then uh, that's generally a good thing. Uh, we'll also be covering behavioural methods of assessment. That's something that you won't have done a, a lot of previously. Uh, why do we conduct behavioural assessment? And then we'll cover the issue of reactivity. So you may have heard uh, before this course something called the Hawthorne effect. When you're being observed and you know you're being observed, you often alter your behaviour. Then briefly, if there's time, we'll cover personality disorders. Okay, so most objective measures for personality are a series of selected response format items. They're either paper and pencil or online. So they're often endorsing agreement or disagreement with a statement. Sometimes they'll use a true-false format as well, like the MMPI. But unlike an achievement test where there's a correct answer, 
there really is no right answer to a personality test. Uh, as long as you're giving a true response, uh, that's deemed as indicative of that particular trait. And if you collect enough of these, as you did on your assignment, you collect enough items, then you can build up an impression of someone's uh, psychological makeup. Now, how objective are these? Well, the term objective is in relation to the personality trait and it must be considered very cautiously. So personality tests do not contain one correct answer. So we can't be sure if the participant has read and understood and answered truthfully. And of course, you know about things like social desirability, impression management, etc. The advantage is that they're quickly and easily scored. Once you've put your survey up, you don't need to sit there uh, as the person fills out the survey. They can complete in their own time, uh, at any location, and that saves you a lot of time as a researcher. There's no human judgment going on there. So it's just a matter of scoring. The disadvantage is issues with insights and limitations of the self-report method, which we covered last week, so I won't go into it. So there may be a lack of objectivity here for some clients. Now, the projective hypothesis, it suggests that individual supplies structure to uh, some ambiguous stimuli that we present. And they do that in a manner that's consistent with their own unique personality, their conscious and unconscious needs, fears, desires, impulses, conflicts, and ways of perceiving and responding. In other words, it's all about their unconscious or implicit uh, desires or traits. And this might differ from a self-report measure because they might reveal something about themselves that they wouldn't admit to you or maybe even to themselves. So basically, give you an example of how it works. Have you ever looked at clouds and daydreamed or interpreted what shapes might look like? Something we always do as a kid. So most times you're just looking at random shapes, but you're projecting some meaning onto them. So what's that remind you of? To me, I kind of see a bit of an elephant there. There's his head. Where's the mouse cursor? There's his head. There's his big ear. There's his long trunk. There's his stumpy little feet. Okay, let's try another one. And anyone see a pattern in that? Or probably a rabbit. There's his ears, there's his head, there's his body. And that's a little mound of dirt that he's standing on. But really, these are all just clouds. They don't have any inherent meaning. And the only meaning that they have is something that you project onto them. So it's just clouds. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have a dirty mind. Okay, so they're said to be indirect methods of personality assessment. By providing ambiguous stimuli, the respondent projects their thoughts and feelings onto it. They're not being asked directly to disclose information about their behaviour, their private life or their personality. So presumably, hopefully, uh, they'll be more truthful than direct questioning. So it's been claimed particularly by uh, the psychoanalysis crowd, that projective testing, uh, it taps the unconscious mind. And we often use this idea of a, meta a metaphor of an uh, iceberg here. There's your top bit that self-reports respond to, but there's this much deeper element, the unconscious mind, that things like a projective test will be tapping into. So Frank, 1939, claimed that the most important things about an individual are what he or she cannot or will not say. 
Now, Rorschach decided uh, to advance this field and provide a standardised test. And the rationale, I think, was that we needed to have some scientific vigour in how we interpret them. We don't just make stuff up on the fly. We have a scoring manual. Uh, this is what is typically seen. This is what is rarely seen. You could sort of work out how to interpret the responses. So he published the monograph Psychodiagnostics was set to, you know, really take on the psychological field and then he went up and died. So unfortunately, he never got to live to see his work being widely used. But it consisted of 10 symmetrical ink blots printed on separate cards, half of which are coloured and the other half are black and white. He offered case studies of responses from normal, healthy people, so the non-clinical, and then from psychiatric cases to illustrate how they differed. Now, is that ringing any bells for anyone? There's a special name that we call this. So empirical criterion king, that it differentiates between a healthy group and a psychiatric group. So the ink plots are initially presented in order from one to 10. So it's standardized, everyone gets the same order. And the test takers are asked to interpret the ink plot and are provided a great deal of freedom. So we sort of encourage their creativity. The more they're um, being creative and uninhibited, the less likely they are to suppress a response that, um, you know, might be socially undesirable. So posthumously, a more refined scoring system was published with greater scoring accuracy. So here's some of the stimuli. What do you see? Well, the one on the bottom left, often people see lungs. You know, the two lungs and the spinal column. Um, the one on the top right, sometimes people see some clowns doing a high five. But whatever you read into it and you tell the therapist about, presumably that gives you some insight into your personality. So this one here, for example, is a really common example that we show students. That looks like a bell and two angels, but uh, it also looks like an eye here and a mouth, some sort of devil mask. And if you're more fixated on the devil mask or the demon, then maybe you're part of the psychiatric group and not the one that just sees innocuous images. So are they threatening, are they hostile, those sorts of themes running through them. So after the entire set of ink blots have been administered, an inquiry is conducted and the assessor attempts to determine what features of the ink blot played a role in formulating the test takers, what we call percept or perception of an image theme. So we don't just say, oh, that looks like um, a bird with some wings. The therapist will ask, well, why do you see that? What in particular are you noticing there? And so I elaborate my answer and that gives me more to score on. So what made it look like whatever it was the patient said? How do you see whatever was reported. And these are standardised prompts. So the advantage, I guess, of the one advantage of the Rorschach is we behave the same way towards the client, whether they see a demon or whether they see a clown. Uh, the aim is to clarify what was seen so it isn't misinterpreted by the tester. And when used carefully, it can be a nice starting point for further conversation and inquiry. So, for example, if I saw a lot of demons and angels and um, mystical creatures, um, 
you've got a recurring theme there and you might want to ask, well, what's your religious background like? Do you think about religious issues a lot? And in a very small percentage of psychiatric cases, uh, they do tend to sort of obsess on religious icon, uh, icons and uh, themes and uh, scripture, and uh, that, that can be indicative of a, you know, a whole range of conditions, but it'd be something you could follow up on. You've now learned something about your patient that you didn't know going in. But, of course, the raw shark is controversial. Jensen, who was a cognitive psychologist, but a very, very respected one, claimed that the rate of scientific progress in clinical psychology might well be measured by the speed and thoroughness with which it gets over the raw shark. Now, that's kind of harsh. Lucky raw shark wasn't alive to read it. So let's have a look at some other tests that use that methodology but with a, a more rigorous scoring system and uh, different types of projective images. So a more common practice used at the time was to present a picture stimuli to subjects and just have them tell a little story. So that works really great with children. Children love telling stories. And Presumably, the themes and issues that I bring up from that picture reflects my worldview, my acculturation, and also the feelings and thoughts that I have going on. So have a look at that picture for a moment. What do you see? Well, someone on the telephone, she's looking very intently at him and he's looking very intently at her. Are they happy expressions? Are they worried? Are they angry? That might tell me just a little bit about how you're thinking and feeling. So let's have a look at some examples. I think we should start seeing other people. That's not a good sign. Maybe my relationship is in a breakdown. Or maybe I'm um, non-monogamous. Maybe that gives you some insight. What about this one? Coming from the telephone, stay on the line. We have officers on the way. Okay, so I'm thinking more sort of violent imagery, conflict, anger. I'm not going to ask what did you story did you make up because I don't want to embarrass anyone. But you can see how, you know, it gets the ball rolling. And if across a lot of images there's a recurring theme, that's something you want to pick up on. So one of the earliest studies before Rorschach and Frank investigated gender differences in imagination. Uh, Britain, 1907, found that girls reported more religious and moral themes in picture cards like the one before than boys. In 1932, Schwartz developed the social situation picture test for juvenile delinquents. And this is really a dated stimuli, so uh, you'll pick up in a moment. There's a boy with a very misshapen head, that does not look normal, uh, <laughs> writing, I'm a bad boy, while looking out the window. So presumably a delinquent would identify with this. I might open up. That was the hope, and I don't think it really worked too well. Uh, there's another one here. He's going out. He looks upset or angry. But he could also just look uh, busy and rushing. He's going out to play. So depending on what responses you give, uh, that might give you some insight. Of course, all of this was really amateur hour. So uh, then Christensen, uh, sorry, Christiana uh, Morgan and Henry Murray published what was called the Thematic Apperception Test, or the TAT. Now we're starting to get some sort of scientific rigour. And you can see here uh, Christiana. She was one of the early female psychologists. I know when you look around the room now, uh, it, is predominantly women in psychology, you know, 60, 70%. But there was a time 
when it was almost exclusively male. And so uh, Morgan was one of those sort of trendsetters who uh, broke open new ground. And the thematic apperception test is still used today. So it consists of 30 picture cards containing a variety of scenes that present the test taker with certain classical human situations. You know, everyday situations that we can all identify with. Then there's an additional card, which is blank. And when we show that one, it gives you the opportunity to project onto it your thoughts and feelings. The cover story that we tell our patients is that this is a test of imagination and totally not a sneaky way to spy on the unconscious mind. Though ethically dubious, but anyway. Uh, when in reality, the administrating clinician purposefully selects cards that are believed to elicit responses. So, for example, if I want to know if you're depressed, I'll show you a sad one. If I want to know if you're anxious, I'll show you one that's going to provoke anxiety. Even though you might not have let on that you're depressed or anxious, if I have a, a suspicion, they're the cards I show you. So the goal, again, is a starting point for conversation, like the raw shark, with the goal to trace the source or the origins of those thoughts and feelings. Now, there's a picture on the right from the TAT. The material used includes the stories as they were told by the examinee. So we make no a mental note of it, or perhaps in a modern age we would do a recording. The clinician notes about the way or the manner in which the examinee responded and also includes what we call extra test behaviour. Are they cooperative? Are they hostile? Do they treat it as a joke? Gives us an insight into how they're thinking and feeling. And if it's an online test, you don't get that extra test behaviour. So it's really useful to observe their body language, tone of voice. There's some example responses to our telephone conversation card given on page 414 of the text. Have a look at it. They're slightly less creepy than mine. Um, for example, a male respondent, this guy's been involved with this girl for a few months. Things haven't been going all that well. He suspected that she's been seeing a lot of guys. So we've got jealousy here. This is just one scene in a whole evening where the phone just hasn't stopped ringing. Pretty soon he's just going to get up and leave. So he's very frustrated. He doesn't like his partner talking to other people, even girlfriends, and suspects infidelity without necessarily there being any evidence. Anyone's alarm bells going off here? That might be something that needs to follow up on. The female response, the couple is dating. They haven't made any plans for the evening and they're wondering what they should do. She's calling up another couple to see if they want to get together. They will go out with the other couple and have a good time. So there's no depression, no paranoia there. So nice, healthy response. And they've got some other ones there. I won't go through them all. I'll leave, you for, uh, leave that for you to read. Okay, so let's go through some of the criticisms of the TAP. Like the Royal Shark, the validity of the TAP is called into question. So there was a meta-analysis by Spangler, 1992. Note the date, fairly recent. So the TAT is still widely used today. It found little correlation between TAT evaluations and self-reported personality. Now, what would a projective psychologist say? Well, of course there's none. These are their unconscious thoughts and feelings. They're not going to admit to it, so we shouldn't expect a high correlation. So uh, that's a criticism, but it's also a defence. So we need a little more. And they would argue this might just be revealing things they wouldn't admit to. 
Other researchers claim it measures what we call implicit motives, the things that you're not consciously aware of, uh, but that are thoughts and issues on our mind. So rather than revealing aspects of personality, maybe it just identifies issues and themes that are going on in our lives. And that can be clinically useful in itself. Um, uh, there's a lack of standardisation in administration, scoring and interpretation procedures. Note that the clinician selects which cards they want to elicit the response, whereas the Royal Shark, you went through all of them in sequence. So, uh, you know, it was standardised. The tap cards themselves, as you saw with that uh, old lady looking over the shoulder, they're rather gloomy and bleak. And so it may restrict the range of affect or uh, feelings projected by the test taker. So perhaps it could be improved by adding some more happy and neutral ones. It's highly susceptible to faking, particularly faking crazy like the raw shark, especially in high intelligence subjects. So if you murder your partner and you want to try to get off on a psychiatric defence and you can find a psychiatrist that is using it, you can probably play crazy pretty well. That's why we have other tests like the MMPI to try to control for that. So while it might not tap deep personality traits, it has been argued that it might be a better indicator of psychological states, and that still is clinically useful. Uh, some other tests that use pictures as pro uh, projective stimuli. We've got the hand test by Ed uh, Edwin Wagner. Now, the hand test is an interesting one. It shows a series of nine cards, so I don't actually make the hand gestures, but it shows the pictures of hands on them and the tenth, like the tat, is a blank card and you can fill that in yourself. The test taker is asked to imagine what the hands on each card might be doing. Uh, I, yes, some of these are, are very suggestive, others are very generic. Now the problem is that there's some cross-cultural variability on hand signals. Facial expressions are universal, but unfortunately hand signals mean different things. So in the US, and because we do everything the Americans do in Australia, thumbs up means good or okay. But in Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan is reported to mean essentially up yours. So it's a rude gesture. So we need to take that into consideration. Remember, whenever you're doing a test, you have to consider the cultural background. And we actually do a really detailed analysis. So this one here, for example, or that one there, uh, we break it down into these four categories. Interpersonal responses. So they claim the hands are preparing for handshakes or offering comfort, communicating by pointing or beckoning or even pushing people away. Then there's environmental responses. Anything about the hand interacting with a non-human object like grabbing, taking something, Closing doors, gripping steering wheels, these sorts of things. No, it's a non-human object. Uh, maladaptive responses. Uh, for example, you insist that a fist is intended to be held up in anger or you're about to punch someone. That obviously indicates aggression. Withdrawal consists of people refusing to go along with the test. So they just don't want to participate for whatever reason. So they often just describe the hand, oh, it's a hand with a finger out. So that's different from saying it's a hand that's pointing towards something or gesturing towards something. 
So you often find these people who, you know, really don't want to participate and go along with it. Now, Wagner came out with a ratio called the acting out ratio, using the hand test score to provide an indication of how likely each subject was to act out violently. For example, this here, I'm about to slap someone across the face. So sometimes it's very hard to make a story out of a hand drawing as you can't see the rest of the body. And so some people really struggle with this test. It's just, you know, they can't, maybe a deficit in theory of mind, they can't work out what the feelings or emotions are uh, for the person who's holding up the hand. Then there's the, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Rosenweig Picture Frustration Study. Really interesting one. It employs some cartoons depicting frustrating situations. So the test taker is asked to fill in the response of the cartoon figure who's frustrated. So this guy here. And whatever they write, that's what we analyse. So it says, it's a shame my car had to break down and you had to miss your train. Now, if I said... No, maybe I said, yeah, it is a shame. I'm worried if the police come up and they open or inspect your car, they're going to see that dead body. Well, obviously that indicates that I'm a violent person or I'm thinking about violent things. If I said, no, it's not that big a deal, we'll make it to the next train, won't be a problem. You know, I'm nice, laid back, relaxed, nothing to worry about. So some people will get really, really frustrated and others will be more laid back and that's useful information. This one here, almost like you wanted to miss it, sort of passive aggressive, that would be really interesting to know. Now the cards are available for children, adolescent and adult samples. So obviously we wouldn't give this to a, ch a child because they're adults, they wouldn't be able to identify with them. And responses are scored in terms of the type of reaction elicited and the direction of the aggression expressed. So do I turn it inward towards me? Yes, I'm, oh, I'm so silly, I should have left earlier, it's all my fault. Or do they turn it outward like this one here? but they're doing it in like a passive aggressive way. So extra punitive is outwardly expressed. Then there's the impunitive. So when I said before, oh, it's no big deal, we'll catch the next one. Uh, I'm sort of avoiding the frustration and avoiding expressing it. Then we have uh, the word association test. And that involves the presentation of a list of stimuli words. It was actually first proposed by Galton, uh, but he wanted to do it as a cognitive measure, so of your intelligence, so how verbally expressive are you. In fact, we still use those types of verbal fluency tests in cognitive studies now. So... Uh, you're asked to respond verbally with the first word that comes to mind, no matter what it is. And obviously I'm going to toss you some softball questions initially to lull you into a false sense of security. And then I'm going to hit you with something to try and tap your unconscious mind. So it was widely used and associated with psychoanalysis, advanced by Carl Jung as a way to tap the unconscious mind. And Rapport, 1945, extended these techniques, developing a standardised test of 60 stimuli words. So everyone gets the same ones. Some are classified as neutral, chair, book, taxi. And that gets you lulled into a false sense of security. You start to build up a rhythm now and you're just blurting out whatever pops into your head. Then we have the traumatic ones. Love, girlfriend or boyfriend, 
depending on the uh, gender. Mother, father, suicide, fire, breast. And so for some people, um, if they had a conflict with father, they might say angry. And that might tell me a little bit about your life. Of course, the psychoanalysis people took it too far probably with the uh, uh, Electra complex and the Oedipus complex with father and mother. But uh, a word like fire or suicide, if they said su uh, to the word suicide, they said peace. Okay, that's told me something really important about what's going on in their mind. So, again, these can be used as sort of icebreakers or to sort of tap that unconscious mind. All right. The thing that's different here is they provided normative data on what was the percentage of the currents of certain words. For example, stomach, 21 replied with ache, 13% with ulcer, no one replied with unicorn. So you know what words are typical and what words are atypical. And if you get one of these atypical ones, you know to pay attention to it. Then there's the sentence completion test. It involves presentation of a list of words that begin a sentence but are incomplete. I don't know if you can read these here. I fear blank. I get angry when blank. Men blank. Tomorrow blank. My best friend blank. So we'll go through a few examples. And the assessee's task is to respond by finishing each sentence with whatever word comes to mind. And you can do this verbally, but it's often better done uh, paper and pencil so that uh, they can actually fill it out themselves. So I like to start fires. Okay, they're not off to a good start. Someday I will conquer the world. Okay, I'm now starting to see a pattern here. Um, there might be some issues. I will always remember the time back behind the bus stop when I etc. So this reveals something about the person. I worry about the return of Cthulhu. Okay, so we've got some recurring issues here. This person's a sick puppy. I'm most frightened when blah, blah, blah. So it may be relatively atheoretical or it may be linked to some theory. So you might use psychoanalytic theory with this or you might use cognitive theory uh, maybe this represents a type of cognitive schema raised by that person. And it gives you some sort of insight. Now, these sentence completion stems may be developed for use in specific settings or for specific purposes. So, for examining uh, family, social, or even sexual attitudes. Uh, these are all good topics to delve into with a client eventually, but sometimes they're reluctant to talk about it. So the sentence completion task kind of gives them almost permission to talk about it. And you can tailor the test toward, and the stems towards the things that you want to ask about. Then there's the figure drawing test. Now you might think, oh, drawing is for kids, but you'll be surprised at how many adults actually draw, how many uh, doodle on the side of a page of lecture notes. I bet some of you are doing it right now. So many people, adults, engage in colouring. So there are colouring books for adults now. So art is one way, and we often use art therapy even, uh, to express yourself. And there's two reasons why this is good. One reason is for diagnostics. The second reason is we know that if you express yourself, you get things off your chest. 
Even if you don't do anything about them, the mere act of expressing it, writing in a diary, et cetera, that can be useful clinically because it, it lowers your anxiety and your depression. Okay, so the figure drawing test, the assessee draws a drawing that is based on the content of a particular topic. So I might say, uh, draw a picture of you and your family. And then if the mother and father are in there and they're happy and the smiles on their faces, that might be different from uh, one of them is missing or they're both scowling or angry or they're shouting. That might give you some insight into a child's life. And drawings provide a wealth of information, especially about issues that are really difficult or traumatic to express verbally. So it's ideally suited to young children that can be used with adolescents and even adults. So there was a, a test called the Draw a Person Test. And we evaluate characteristics of the drawing and then infer something about their personality. We evaluate the length of time required to complete the picture. So are they a perfectionist? They take 20 minutes or is it just a quick scroll? We evaluate uh, things like the placement of the figures. So if there are two figures next to each other or very far apart, the size of the figure, pencil pressure used, symmetry, line quality, shading. Facial expressions are actually quite important. Posture, clothing and overall appearance. Now, clinicians will often follow up with questions about the drawn images. So tell me about that boy or girl, or tell me about that man or lady. And the responses uh, are related, and the questions that we ask are related to hypotheses and interpretations about personality functioning. So I'm going to show you, uh, I had some reluctance to include this, but it is in the text and you would have seen it anyway. The picture on the left, is drawn by an adult male rapist. Big, burly, strong, dominant. That's the way he sees himself. Now, most people are just going to draw a stick figure. If they've got more artistic ability, they probably wouldn't draw themselves like that, certainly with no shirt. So that tells me something about the person. Now, the one to the right is even sadder. Now, pedophilia is a terrible crime, but we know that often abused children, if they don't receive intervention and therapy, and a lot of them aren't even identified, sometimes, not always, but sometimes go on to become abusers. So you might see a client and you might get the referral, he's a male uh, pedophile, but this suggests that he has a very childlike perception of himself. Probably what Freud would, or Erickson would call, arrested development. Developmentally, he did not progress beyond a child. Something really bad happened there, and we would need to delve into it. So hopefully it illustrates the usefulness of the draw a person test, but also um, uh, there's a tinge of sadness there with some of the clients that might, uh, you might encounter. Another one for children is the kinetic family drawing or KFD, not to be confused with the kernel. So a uh, child draws a picture of his or her entire family, including themselves doing something, some activity. It helps learn about the uh, helps learn about the examinee in relation to his or her family. There's even non-clinical applications, so to tag attitudes and beliefs. So the drawer scientist test examines gender stereotypes about science, technology, engineering, and math. Almost exclusively, that is what we get. We get a white male scientist. A recent 2007 study found that only 14% of girls drew a female scientist. 
while 86% drew a male. So that gives me some insight into societal attitudes uh, towards science. We obviously need to do something there. Uh, now, there's more about projective methods on page 425 to 428. Uh, we've got some assumptions underpinning them. They would be fair game to assess, as well as criticisms of uh, the uh, projective tests. So criticisms, well, projective stimulus is only one aspect of the total stimuli situation. There's other things going on. Uh, the stimuli material may be so ambiguous that you can't interpret it, or it may be so transparent that they know what you're asking. So it shows someone arguing or a really sad scene, then it's no longer ambiguous and we can't really project onto it. We're just reporting what we're seeing. And some assumptions are cherished beliefs, these ones over here, that are less subject to faking, but the evidence behind that is contested. Okay, there's more pros and cons there. So uh, please do have a look at that uh, when time permits. So I just want to go through some further assumptions. Uh, that every response provides meaning for personality analysis. That a relationship exists between the strength of a need or a desire or a feeling, these unconscious things, and its manifestation on these projective instruments. Now, it may be that the type of stimuli that you're giving them might be leading them towards one set, like the tat that was rather gloomy, and doesn't lead them towards their more positive, uh, optimistic desires. Test takers are completely unaware of what they're disclosing about themselves. That's an assumption. Now, in high intelligence individuals, uh, they could well be faking it. The raw shark ink block test is publicly available. Someone dumped it on the interwebs about five years ago. So you can actually practice your responses. You can write down a really elaborate story and coach yourself for the raw shark. So that's potentially an issue. Uh, a projective uh, testing protocol reflects sufficient data concerning personality functioning to formulate a judgment. I would argue that you should supplement it with other tests and other sources of information though. So you can still use them, but don't make it the sole criteria for judgment. It also assumes that there is a parallel but between behaviour obtained on a projective instrument and behaviour displayed in social situations. In other words, this test is actually measuring how you would behave. Now, I don't really like to start fires, but I do like to make a joke about it. So remember there was the response set that we covered last week, the deviant response set. Sometimes people will try to shock the therapist by giving bizarre or unusual answers. So they don't always reflect how you're actually thinking and feeling. Uh, how are we going for time? Okay, well, we might just pause it there and hopefully uh, come back in about five or ten minutes and we'll hit it hard. We might even be able to get an early break. Okay, so before the break, uh, we just arrived at behavioural assessment methods. I, I think we've probably covered personality quite a few times throughout the degree with uh, the personality subject now, a couple of weeks on personality, and we've almost always gone for self-reports. And projective is probably new material. Behavioural methods uh, will be new material too. So um, behavioural data, it can be really useful for clinicians. 
Um, given that we have these problems with self-report and questionable validity of some rejective methods, not all, but some. Ultimately, though, we study personality because we want to be able to predict future behaviour. We want to understand what motives are driving that behaviour. So behavioural assessment uh, is critical. And you wouldn't normally want to conduct an uh, assessment in a clinical setting without also observing uh, the client's behaviour. So there's a quote here by Michel, uh, 1968. By the way, can anyone remember the marshmallow experiment with the child and delayed gratification? That was Michel. So uh, Michel said that the emphasis is on what a person does in situations rather than on inferences about what attributes he has more globally. So Michel really believed in behavioural assessment, less so on actual personality. But the differences, I think, between the traditional and behavioural approaches to assessment have to do with different assumptions. These are assumptions about the nature of behaviour and, in particular, the causes of behaviour. So there's a nice little table there in the text comparing the behavioural and the traditional approach. So a behavioural approach, personality constructs mainly employed to summarise specific behaviour patterns. So I might observe you in a whole different, heap of different settings and see whether you're extroverted or not. Whereas the traditional approach would tend to use a self-report and would say that personality is a reflection of enduring traits or underlying states. And... There's a whole range of details there. I'm going to leave that for you to have a look at in the text, but I'm just going to go through a few of them. Uh, role of history is relatively unimportant with the behavioural, but it's crucial with the traditional approach because we argue that the present is predictive of the, is, is determined by the past behaviour. And... Uh, we use data very differently. So with the behavioural approach, we're just looking at the observation of the behaviour. We're not looking at uh, the underlying personality there. So they're very different approaches. But a personality psychologists will often still use behavioural assessment. So it often provides a different type of information than a self-report. And in fact, funder labels this as B data, behavioural data. It's especially important in clients who are unwell, so they lack self-insight, or they're unable to articulate and just communicate well. And you'll see, for example, in some, if, when you go on to do abnormal, uh, some of the schizophrenic type uh, thought disorders they often come across as very jumbled in their communication. So you've got to rely more on behavioural data. And the goal of behavioural assessment is to pinpoint the environmental conditions that are acting to either trigger, maintain or extinguish certain behaviours. So let's say, for example, that a child is anxious what sort of things are making the child anxious? What is the child's triggers? So we might want to observe what are those behavioural triggers that cause, a, you know, a, a burst of anxiety. So we might observe children or parents interacting in a natural environment and also the family dynamics. We might really try to narrow down on the triggers that cause a child to stress or to misbehave in a school setting or when playing with other children. Is it they don't like sharing that's the problem? Is it they don't like sitting in one spot? You know, you try to identify what are the triggers, what are the causes. 
And then we might target specific behavioural patterns for modification through interventions, like classical conditioning for a phobia, like operant conditioning for a behaviour. So essentially to explain, to predict, or also to correct behaviour. That's why we conduct a behavioural assessment. Now, behavioural assessment generally involves watching the activities of targeted clients or research subjects and maintaining some kind of record of those activities. So it could be an audio record that you then transcribe. It could be a notepad or clipboard that you're noting. It could also be a behavioural checklist. So you tick these off as you go. So researchers, clinicians or counsellors may themselves serve as the observers or they might designate trained assistants. So see page 436. And that's a good area sometimes for psychology graduates before they become a psychologist to actually do these behavioural observations. It's a useful job skill. It gives you experience. Or we might designate other people like parents or teachers or siblings in an organisational psychology, maybe supervisors. And of course, we do this routinely in intelligence and educational assessments as well. It's what we call extra test behaviour. Are they compliant? Are they willing to do it? Are they motivated? Are they distracted? These sorts of things are useful clinically to know. And in fact, to sort of standardise this, we often have a behavioural rating scale. It's a pre-printed sheet on which the observer notes the presence or intensity of targeted behaviours, usually by, uh, usually by just checking a box or filling in uh, some open terms. So if you have a look at page 437. Now, there's lots of varieties. So while the data gathered by behavioural observation and ratings is useful, it still does have its problems. So if you were being observed by a psychiatrist, if they're watching your every move, uh, might that make you feel slightly uncomfortable or even paranoid? Probably would. In fact, I've talked to people from psychiatric hospitals and some people think the nurses are watching them all the time. The cleaning staff is watching them all the time because they're so focused on being observed when in reality they're probably too overburdened and too busy to really be paying much attention. But it ch often changes their behaviour. So we call this the Hawthorne effect. If you know you're being observed, then you're likely to change your behaviour. And also, it might make it harder to develop a positive therapeutic rapport if you feel you're being watched and judged. So if you were in a mental health clinic, would you want to know what the psychi psychiatric nurses are writing about you? Pretty sure you would. You might not be happy with what it is, but you would want to know. So th this ongoing monitoring can be an issue. So we have this term, it's called reactivity. When they're conscious of being observed and assessed, they often change their behaviour, also known as the Hawthorne effect. Now sometimes too, uh, we might engage clients to actually self-monitor behaviour. So we might give you a mood diary, which is something we commonly do with CBT, or a thoughts diary. We might give you, let's say we're doing a, a dietary intervention, uh, we might give you a food diary where you list all the foods and maybe the feelings you have when you're eating them. So the client might be asked to monitor their own behaviour, thoughts and feelings. And we use this really strongly in CBT. We do this to identify patterns and triggers, but most importantly to provide insight. Now, this technique is called self-monitoring on page 437. Often now, we use it with mobile phones since most people have one. 
and I have the smartphone, a little prompt comes up and at different times of the day we might ask you how you're thinking or feeling. So while it provides useful info, this self-monitoring can be an intervention in itself. So if you're doing a food diary, maybe you're going to pay more attention to the foods that you eat. If anyone here is into exercise, Fitbits were the craze. And the idea was that if you're held to account, even if it's just to yourself, about the number of steps you've walked today, well, you might be motivated to increase it. So things like a Fitbit uh, were initially hypothesised to be an intervention. Not everyone can stick with it, but uh, for some people it really does uh, help. In research studies, we often employ what we call mood sampling or experiential sampling by polling participants at, ran, uh, at a random sample of times. And then we sort of can track variability across the day. Are there particular times of the day where the mood drops? Some people are a morning person, some people are an evening person, and uh, some psychiatric moods uh, can get worse at night, for example. And the ubiquity of smartphones has made this easily achievable. And it's really low cost to collect data. So have a look at behavioural assessment using smartphones. This is from an earlier chapter, but it's page five to six. Now, one advantage of behavioural assessment is it can occur in naturalistic concept, uh, 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 context. So outside of the clinic, and can be used to identify a pattern of behaviour. For example, this kitty, I think he's got a drinking problem. So it can even be used to assess behaviour in the past, such as with the timeline follow back, TLFB method. And there's more about that in the text. But I'll give you an example. Are you a problem drinker? You're probably going to say no the first time. Then I ask, you say something like, I don't know, I only drink socially. Then how many drinks did you have in the last week? Oh, okay. Um, five or six? How many drinks did you have on your birthday? One or two bottles? Okay, so we might be starting to think that there's a drinking problem there. But note that the initial response was, no, I only ever drink socially. So the more detailed you know, you dig into this, you might find a different picture. Uh, but yeah, so kitty got a drinking problem. So another uh, technique is what we call analog studies. Analog behavioural observation is the observation of a person in an environment designed to increase the chance that we can observe uh, a particular type of behaviour. It could be job performance, it could be your ability to handle stress in a stressful situation. But we tailor the environment to elicit certain behaviours. So there's one called, uh, using in organisational psychology, a situational performance measure. It allows for observation and evaluation of an individual under a standardised set of circumstances, like a driving test or answering a help desk, or operating a cash register and speaking to uh, members of the public. That is a useful way to assess your uh, future job performance. There's this really interesting one. It's called the leaderless group technique. So several people, and we, we have lots of applicants, and they're organised into a group for the purpose of carrying out a task. And an observer is sitting over at the side just watching and recording. They're noting who shows initiative, who starts to get the group working together, who's cooperative and who doesn't seem to be able to work in a team. And this is really useful information then if you're hiring a job applicant because if they say on their resume, I'm a team person, how do you know if it's true? So organisational psychologists will often have 
personality questionnaires, they will have behavioural observation. Depends, I guess, on the importance of the job and the, the cost of the salary as to how far we go. Often, though, we'll engage in role play. So let's say, for example, I'm interested in uh, admitting people from the honours program into masters. We often do a role play and we get students to do a behavioural intake assessment with a client. Now, the client is just another member of staff, but uh, they may be evasive, they may be difficult to get information from, and we see how does the applicant handle that situation. So role plays are a really good way. Uh, in a clinical setting, let's say we're dealing with someone with social anxiety, we might role play a social encounter with the client. So they want to talk to their boss, they're unhappy about their working condition, I'll act as the boss, they talk to me and they practice and they build up gradually to the point where they could actually talk to their boss. So we often use role play in therapy as well. Then we have psychophysiological measures. We know that the problem of reactivity is a really serious issue. Unless they don't know that they're being observed and we're using covert observation. And there's ethical issues, of course, associated with that. And one thing that we know is it's really hard to fake bodily processes. You know, if I'm stressed, I can say, oh, no, I'm not really stressed, I'm, I'm quite calm. I might even appear calm on the outside. But if you measure my heart rate and it's beating, I don't know, 120, 130 beats per minute, my blood pressure is 180 over 90, then probably I'm stressed and I can't consciously lower that. You know, unless you've done some sort of uh, Buddhist training and meditation, you can't generally alter your heart rate. Uh, blood pressure, EEG, even your body temperature. So these are observable behaviours that are believed to be affected by psychological processes. So, for example, a psychiatrist might measure blood pressure before, during or after a session. If we bring up a particular uh, traumatic issue, I can get an indication of how traumatic it is by the effect it had on your biology. Conversely, if you're telling me uh, about this terrible traumatic incident and your blood pressure goes down, and your heart rate goes down, I might have reason to doubt the veracity of your claim. So heart rate, well, we might take continual measurements during an experiment, for example. So if we're doing something sort of exercise task, we often get them to read, uh, wear a heart rate monitor. But we could just as easily do it while they're performing a test, particularly a high stakes test, uh, or while they're talking about their childhood, these sorts of things. Uh, there's one intervention that's really useful, and we sometimes use it with attention deficit disorder, called biofeedback. Now, biofeedback is designed to gauge, display and record a continuous monitoring of a biological process, like brain waves or heart rate. In particular, I'm thinking of brain waves. So it's applied in the therapeutic technique, biofeedback, where a patient learns to relax muscles for tension headaches or to alter brain waves for attention deficit disorder. So it's another one of those examples of a behavioural measurement actually being an intervention in itself. Uh, we have this thing called, a, and I hope I'm pronouncing it right, plethysmograph, 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 there we go. 
Uh, it's an instrument that records changes in the volume of a body part arising from variations in blood supply. And it's been used to examine normal uh, versus anxious ridden people and also clinical populations. So we might measure blood supply on the forearm during testing sessions. Have a look at page uh, 440. Now it might be testing sessions for a high stake exam or it could be a clinical session, a therapeutic session and we want to know when the client is starting to get uh, particularly stressed. It can also collect uh, phallometric data on page 441. Uh, this, uh, it literally wraps around the penis and as the penis expands then it records that measurement. So it's very hard to fake these types of things. And uh, it's often used uh, actually with people with erectile function disorder, but it's also used in forensic settings if we show you a particular type of stimuli. Uh, it is unfortunately also used in gay conversion therapy to measure uh, someone's interest in a certain type of stimuli. Um, but they're actually female equivalents too. So I'll leave you more to read up on that in the book because I'm going to try to gloss over that one. Okay, then we have the polygraph. Now everyone's heard of a polygraph. We've seen it on the TV show. I'm assuming that you've watched at least one procedural law enforcement drama or legal drama. You've seen the polygraph. How easy is it to beat? Is it foolproof? Can we use it in evidence? These are themes often explored in popular culture. Now, despite its prevalence in crime shows, polygraphs are not admissible for evidence in a court of law. So it won't exonerate you and say that you're innocent, but it could well damn you and trick you into uh, confessing. So, how might it do that? Well, sometimes a person wants to really prove to law enforcement that they're willing to go along. But they might get a false reading on the machine. Or police may lie about what the machine is saying. They're allowed to do that. So it's used by law enforcement to cast doubt on a suspect's recollection or to apply psychological pressure to amp up the stress and maybe coerce a confession. Unfortunately, though, there's a high false positive rate. So even if you're telling the truth, up to 50% of innocent subjects will be labelled as evasive or as lying, even if it's just about innocuous things, not related to the case. So that's kind of troubling. And when that happens, you feel pressured then to try to explain or come up with a different story and then that's where you run into trouble. So that's why lawyers are very reluctant to ever let their clients sit a polygraph. It won't get them free and could well damn them. We also know too that psychopaths or those with special training are often able to lie and beat a polygraph. So its validity is dubious. Just because you polygraph says you, you, you weren't lying doesn't mean that you're innocent. So unfortunately, they're not really that useful. But they're still widely used by law enforcement. So I've got a lovely slide there explaining how it works. Now, supporters claim that they have an 85 to 95% accuracy rate. But critics say there's not enough scientific evidence to say whether it uh, detects lies or not. And how it works? Well, we've got across the chest here, we've got sensors that uh, measure body movement. So breathing in, breathing out of the chest. We have perspiration there on the fingers. There we go. Okay. It's measuring what we call galvanic skin response. If you didn't know, when you sweat, it's not just water, 
includes salts. And salty water conducts electricity. The more salty water it is, the more electricity it's conducting. And so we can get a sensor there to detect uh, how much you're swimming. Uh, we have a laptop that's measuring all this data and we don't show it to the client. So they don't know what's going on. They're already anxious. They're hooked up to all these machines. This makes people stressed. So they're likely to show an elevated response anyway, even if they're innocent. And then sometimes they might turn that laptop around and say, see this bump? This blip, it means you're lying. And then the person just panics. And of course, then their blood pressure does go up. Their heart rate does go up. They start sweating more. And so that's where you start to, uh, you know, particularly for an anxious individual, sort of fall apart. Oh, one other thing too. Um, ah, I've gone too far back. Oh, no. Silly me. One thing that I did want to show you too is that you're asked yes or no questions. So there's no opportunity to explain or elaborate. I might ask, have you ever lied before? Have you ever stolen from your employer? Now, even if it's a paper clip or a pen, which let's say 99% of people are going to do, uh, to answer truthfully, he's got to answer yes. So already I've painted him as a liar. He's feeling really stressed. I say, what else have you lied about? Did you lie about the crime? So these yes or no answers are a really good way to eliminate the opportunity to elaborate and make someone really stressed. You can paint them into a corner. Okay. Now, the advantages of psychophysiological. One advantage is that it's difficult or perhaps even impossible without training to fake. You know, unless you're a psychopath or unless you've been trained in uh, deception training, you're not going to be able to fake the heart rate or the blood pressure. In a sense, it's said to be non-reactive. Now, your book labels this term as unobtrusive. But personally, I think if I were hooked up to an EEG brain scanner, or you're monitoring my biometric, I would feel that's really intrusive on my privacy. So most people will use the term non-reactive, but uh, you can use the term unobtrusive as well. Uh, some devices, like the new Apple Watch, will collect data silently, such as heart rate or even EEG for heart arrhythmia. So it measures your pulse and it can work out if there's an erratic heartbeat. It's actually saved lives because a lot of people with heart arrhythmia don't realise they have it. It will even detect falls and alert emergency services. So it's a good way of technology collecting more biometric data. I imagine there will come a time where the Apple iWatch does an awful lot more. They're trying to integrate it with health. But uh, where even your phone, I mean, your phone tracks your, your movements because it's got GPS and it's got to connect to the phone tower. You can build up a map of where someone's been, behavioural data, simply by analysing uh, where that phone has moved. So these uh, behavioural and psychophysiological data can be used uh, for good purposes, but potentially for surveillance and law enforcement as well. Uh, and I would imagine most psychological, psychophysiological measures will actually become genuinely unobtrusive. You won't have to wear a big EEG helmet or have something nice and small that uh, is a wearable. Now, the book outlines uh, some other genuinely unobtrusive measures on page 442. I'm going to give you a modern example, and that's in the form of uh, detecting consumption of illicit drugs from sewerage. Now, the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, which is probably one you haven't heard of, they don't advertise it, 
Uh, they have this National Wastewater Drug Monitoring Program. It monitors illicit drug usage across nine sites in Australia. That was written last year. It's expanded considerably since. And it's based on international studies. And what they do is they go and they collect sewage runoff. And then they check it for medications. Most drugs don't get fully metabolised by the body and are passed out through uh, your urine or your sewage. So you might have spent a lot of money on that head of ecstasy, but most of it's going to go down the drain. So it provides hard data on drug usage patterns over time. So we can identify whether drug usage is going up or drug usage is going down. So uh, marijuana usage, uh, unless you're having a really bad trip, you're not going to report to the emergency room. So how are we going to know how many people are doing weed and is it going up or down? They're not going to admit to it on a self-report. So this is what programs like this uh, do. And so we don't just know that... Uh, ice and meth is going up from hospital admissions, we also know from looking at the sewage, there's way more people consuming it than are ever presenting to the emergency room or to law enforcement. So we can actually isolate it to particular blocks or facilities. So we could go to the local prison and we could see what the drug usage is there. And it would not surprise many of you to know that it, there's actually are drugs being used in prison. So a really useful source of behavioural data, unobtrusive, no one ever really knows, but spare a thought for that poor lab technician. Can you imagine going into the sewer and then having to test it? Ugh, yucky. Okay. So now I'm going to get to a part of the book that covers personality disorders. Now, I'm going to show you a clip. Uh, it's by a comedian, Tommy Tien, and you might have seen him on TV or you may not. But he's going to talk about uh, the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. The reason I'm playing not to this clip, not to make fun of people who have such diagnoses, but it illustrates how easily someone can be misdiagnosed particularly with borderline personality disorder. Okay, so if I'm lucky, it will play and we will be able to hear it. Let's turn the volume up. I, uh... Oh, come on. Play. Um, play. No, it's not going to work. I can't zoom in. You mental health issues. <laughs> I was diagnosed recently with a thing that wasn't an accurate diagnosis, but they, it served its purpose for a short time. Borderline personality disorder. <laughs> Borderline. It doesn't mean that I almost have a personality. It means, according to a book, they think that I walk a thin line, a borderline, like a mental health refugee, <laughs> between psychosis and neurosis. I'm either psychotic or neurotic. Neurotic, bad for me. Psychotic, bad for you. <laughs> Basically, I'm not good on my own or with people. Okay. <clears throat> so borderline personality disorder, it's a very controversial one. So are many of the other personality disorders. And uh, the reason is they're hard to diagnose. Often they fluctuate the symptoms. So... You may be diagnosed with it at one point in life and that label follows you. 
and stigmatises you. To all future health professionals who get that on a referral form. Okay, so... All right. Now, the book that he mentioned is the DSM-5. It's the Bible of psychiatry. It contains a copy of every known psychiatric diagnosis. But, of course, we're continually updating that as we uh, learn more about mental health. It's undergone a lot of revisions. For example, uh, homosexuality was defined as a mental illness until, I think, 1972, and then it was taken out. There are some psychiatric conditions yet to be recognised that will not be in that book. And there is a competing one, the ICD, International Classification of Disorders, that has some extra ones that the DSM hasn't. So uh, you'll cover more of this in Abnormal, but it is not complete. It is an ongoing work in progress. Uh, now, it contains a number of mental health conditions like depression, PTSD, etc. But what we're going to cover here is uh, how we diagnose personality disorders. So for these conditions, it specifies a range of symptoms, some but not all of which are required for a diagnosis. For example, depression, I think it's five out of nine criteria from memory. You don't need to have all of them. Oh, five out of eight, sorry. Uh, only uh, five of which need to be met. Now, a personality disorder, it's a class or a cluster of mental disorders characterised by what we call enduring patterns, maladaptive patterns of behaviour, cognition and affect. It's hurting the client. It's hurting society, those people around the client. It's not helpful to them, but they may be limited in their capacity to change. Now, up till now, we've treated personality as either a trait or as a state. But this is collections of traits. Personality disorders are clusters of maladaptive traits. Now, the DSM-5 outlines 10 different personality disorders, some of which overlap considerably, making diagnosis difficult. And you'll see in a moment as we talk about them that there's a fair degree of overlap. We divide them into cluster A, odd or eccentric, cluster B, dramatic or erratic, and cluster C, anxious or fearful or sad. Now, there's a terrible, terrible way to remember these. It used to go the mad, the bad, and the sad. And in fact, clinicians still view these disorders that way. Anyone with a diagnosis of schizophrenia, schizotypal, schizoid, uh, paranoid personality disorder, well, they're completely mad. And that label then stigmatises them and it guides how they will be treated. So if I tell you about my neighbour who's always sticking his head over the fence and uh, I, I don't like the way he looks at my kids and I've got a label of paranoid personality disorder, what interpretation are you going to make? Well, of course, I'm being paranoid. It fits with the diagnosis. So that label, that stigma can actually change how you treat and accept the patient. It may well be that neighbour is a bit of a busybody and it's not really a paranoid, but you've got that label, then you sort of attribute the behaviour or what the client is saying to the diagnosis. A cluster B we have the bad. So the antisocial personality disorder, someone who's aggressive, criminality, lack of empathy. Someone who starts fights and is aggressive, they'll often be labelled with antisocial personality disorder. 
if they're a male. If they're a female, they're more likely to be labelled instead as borderline personality disorder. Oh, they have abrupt mood swings, they love you and they hate you. Sometimes they engage in self-harm. Let's say they don't have the self-harm though, but abrupt mood swings sort of ties in with aggression. Love, hate sort of ties in with aggression, but there's a gendered nature to a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. This other one, histrionic, tension-seeking, abrupt mood swings. Again, a lot of overlap. It's hard to differentiate between the two. And if you're female, you're more likely to be diagnosed with these disorders. If you're a male, you're more likely to be diagnosed for the same behaviour with antisocial personality. And now narcissistic one, uh, this actually can be quite difficult to work with. Uh, there are a lot of narcissists in the world and uh, yeah, I'm sure you've met some of them. But the, the differentiation between someone who's a little bit egocentric, narcissistic, they think only in themselves, and someone with a personality disorder is it's in a much more extreme form. They have this lack of empathy, it's all about me, and they have this profound need for admiration. Uh, then we have cluster C. So these are the anxious or the fearful people. Uh, the avoidant personality disorder, where they have social inhibition, they feel inadequate, so low self-esteem. They're sensitive to negative evaluations. It just crushes them. But this is also similar to a social anxiety disorder. So you need to be a very skilled clinician to differentiate between the two. And there are plenty of people with a social anxiety disorder or who are just uh, introverted, who might be low in self-esteem. That doesn't mean that they have uh, this particular personality disorder. So you've got to be very careful, you know, when you're learning about this stuff, particularly if, when you go on to abnormal, you don't try to self-diagnose. It really takes a very skilled clinician and a wide range of behaviour to observe before you make these diagnoses. And then this dependent personality disorder. They are psychologically dependent on others. They are worried if their mother leaves them or their father leaves them. Uh, they worried something will happen to them, that they'll be abandoned. They're very insecure. So that insecure attachment style that we talked about previously. But it's almost to a pathological state. Uh, then there's the obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Not to be confused with true OCD. So the naming here is a bit confusing, but they have a high need for conformity, rules, perfectionism, but it's not actual OCD. It's just that they really organise, they need order and they need structure and uh, there's almost this compulsive element to it. So uh, you might have come across that term if you're doing a perfectionism uh, uh, questionnaire scale. But it's differentiated from OCD, who also has a lot of other elements. So the issue of personality disorders is not without controversy. The reason why is there's considerable overlap between disorders. The diagnosis can be difficult uh, and requires extensive training. Multiple clinicians may be used in these evaluations and they may disagree on the diagnosis. So you also need a detailed case history and the pattern needs to be enduring. Now, one either has a personality disorder or one does not. And there's no middle ground, not like the depression where you only need five out of the eight. So uh, you can read more about it in the text, the all or none error. Uh, but personality disorders aren't always stable across time and they fluctuate, particularly in response to psychosocial stresses, to the level of support that they're getting and also to um, 
their medications they're receiving. So a diagnosis of a personality disorder is stigmatising. So many psychologists refuse to take on a client if they get a referral letter that suggests a borderline personality disorder. Now, if that client has been misdiagnosed, they're denied access to mental health treatment. And that's a very bad thing. Particularly if they've been misdiagnosed and they're vulnerable and they just need a little bit of help and would actually benefit from psychological counselling. Many clinicians argue that there's a gender bias in the diagnosis. So Kaplan, 1983, argued that certain personality disorders such as histrionic, dependent, it pathologises stereotypically feminine behaviour. Now, no one is an island unto themselves. We need people around. And so needing people isn't necessarily a bad thing or a weakness. Taken too far, if you don't need people, that is a mental illness in itself. So uh, many of the traits are characters of the traditional feminine role. And some symptoms are more sex typical for males or females and it may lead to women uh, to overly express certain behaviours while men may hide them. So it would be very hard for a man to admit, oh, well, you know, I'm very dependent on my wife and uh, I couldn't survive without my kids. And you go... So it's, it's less socially acceptable, so they may hide that part and they may not be diagnosed. So, you know, there, there's some issues with uh, these personality diagnoses. And some have claimed that this, plus the comorbidity across uh, personality disorders, leads to a gender bias in diagnoses. So violent or destructive behaviour might lead to a diagnosis of antisocial PD for males and borderline for females, even for the same behaviour. Additionally, you need to have all of the traits of a personality disorder or you do not qualify. There's no middle ground or on a spectrum like uh, autism spectrum disorder. The textbook talks about the all or none error but we also know that personality disorders aren't stable. So people often dip in and dip out of the criteria uh, for a um, personality disorder. So if a different clinician sees them, they might reach a different diagnosis. And in particular, in response to life events, medication and psychosocial support. Additionally, there's a high comorbidity across personality disorders. So many question, and you can read more about this in the text because we're running out of time, but they question the validity of these diagnoses and whether they might be better represented as symptoms of existing disorders, like an anxiety disorder, like a depression, etc. All right, so I've got some multiple choice questions there for you to have a look at. I just want to get you into the practice of thinking about tests. because We do have a test coming up. And I've got some short answer questions there to sort of prompt your thinking. Please do read the textbook. This is one of those chapters that is a little more important than others. So please do the readings. And if you've got any questions about the assignment, come see me in consult. Come see your tutors. Don't forget that it's June next week. And I will see you next week, hopefully.